to wine later on this evening. So I'm very pleased to introduce our speakers tonight, Andrew Coe and Joseph Green. Andrew Coe is Assistant Professor of Classical Studies at Brandeis. He received his PhD in Art and Archaeology of the Mediterranean World from the University of Pennsylvania in 2006, during which he was an associate member of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens from 2003 to 2004, and, ex and an exchange scholar at Stanford University's Archaeology Center and Department of Classics from 05 to 06. He currently serves as the co-director of graduate studies in the Department of Classical Studies at Brandeis and is a Florence Levy K. Fellow in their Department of Chemistry. He's also a faculty member with the Center for Materials Research in Archaeology and Ethnology at MIT. He's the author of two books, Wreathed in a Fragrant Cloud, Reconstructing a Late Bronze Age Aegean Workshop at Aramata, published in 2008, and another work in preparation for the University of California Press called Residual History, Perfumes, Potions, and Purple Dye in Antiquity. That will be a finalist for the Alliteration in Archaeology Prize <laughs> as soon as it's published. From 2012 to 13, he worked on the development of the exhibition Dead Sea Scrolls, Life in Ancient Times, in collaboration with the Boston Museum of Science. And since 2003, he served as the director of archaeochemistry research in the Eastern Mediterranean Project, and since 2009, has served as the associate director of the Haifa G.W. Brandeis Cobri Archaeological Project in Israel. And as of this year, he's been appointed the director of the Brandeis at Petrus Archaeological Field School in Crete. God, I'm exhausted just reading all these achievements. How do you do all this? In 2013, Andrew was part of a research team that discovered what is believed to be the oldest and largest wine cellar in the ancient Near East. And you're in for a treat to hear about that tonight. So he'll share with us tonight how this discovery was made and what it tells us about the people who lived in the Near East during the Middle Bronze Age, so that's 1900 to 1600 BCE, and the wine they enjoyed. And I might just add that Andrew and I, in another life, were both on the faculty at Tufts University many years ago, so I can tell you, you are indeed in for a special evening. The next speaker is someone I have the privilege of working with every single day, so I know what a fantastic scholar and colleague he is. Joseph Green is the deputy director and curator of the Harvard Semitic Museum. He received his PhD from the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago in 1986. He served as the assistant director of the Semitic Museum from 94 until 2012. Between 90 and 93, he worked as the director of publications for the American Schools of Oriental Research Punic Project and Ashkelon Excavations, as well as the curator of publications for the Semitic Museum. From 87 to 88, he served as director of the Jordan Department of Antiquities Cultural Resource Management Project, part of the American Center of Oriental Research, United States Agency for International Development. Since 2012, he's been a member of the Advisory Committee for the Museum Studies Program here at Harvard in the Division of Continuing Education, and he's also been a member of the Standing Committee on Archaeology at Harvard since 2010. Tonight, Joe will place the discovery of the cellar in context of the social and cultural history of wine's emergence in the ancient Near East and the Mediterranean world. So we will have our two speakers. We'll have a few minutes for questions. They will serve on our panel and those chairs afterwards. And then we'll hear a little bit about the tantalizing wines that you will all be able to experience right next door in the Harvard Civic Museum. Please join me in welcoming Andrew Coe and Joseph Green. It's a pleasure to always see Peter. I want to thank everybody who's been involved in organizing uh, this event. I know there were a lot of moving parts, and uh, that in itself is a remarkable achievement. Um, just to get into it, uh, our story starts, believe it or not, in 2013, as was mentioned, uh, in the month of June. And this is really the almost immediately after the discovery, let's say several days after uh, the vessel we luckily call, we uh, fondly call Bessie for various reasons. Um, as you'll see, there are a couple other vessels poking up out of the ground. Uh, people always ask, did you ever take the picture when only the top of Bessie was revealed? And honestly, we didn't want to take a picture because what happens is when you are excited about a find, it ends up being the only find. So we kind of held off and this, as far as we know, is the first picture we have of what will become the wine cellar. Uh, before we talk about June of 2013, we actually have to go back a little further and talk about the impetus uh, behind this study. 
Uh, it's been going on for approximately a decade, uh, an extension of my dissertation research. This whole idea and concept of, uh, of Mediterranean trade throughout uh, antiquity, but especially during the Bronze Age. I focus in particular in the second millennium uh, BC. And there are some intriguing questions that come to the forefront right away. In question, you can see uh, two of the major ones listed. For one, how do we reconstruct this early trade in commodities? And how did this early trade help define later activities? So while we're going to zoom in on this wine cellar, it is in fact uh, part of a larger picture that I'll touch upon. And I'm, I'm sure Dr. Green will then continue uh, with the second half of today's presentations. So as many of you know, uh, early Mediterranean trade was quite robust. We know definitely by the year 2000 or so, uh, there were at least localized areas of trade. Um, this is um, the network, as it's loosely called, um, throughout most of the Bronze Age. We're, we're fairly certain that most ships did not go across the whole circuit, but at least at certain times, uh, some of them might have, like the Uluguruan shipwreck, which many of you know. Our focus will be on two areas, um, the southern Levant, um, southern Phoenicia, now northern Israel, and uh, the eastern part of Crete. Uh, to go even to the, the genesis of this project, it starts at the University of Pennsylvania Museum, where as a graduate student, I was fortunate enough not just to reside in the Mediterranean section or the Egyptian section, but I was uh, you know, lucky enough to traverse the different sections and notice these vessels that people have noticed throughout the ages, throughout the years, um, like a Mycenaean stirrup jar, a Cypriot bilbil, and the Tel el Yodia juglet from Egypt and the Southern Levant. But many people have not, in fact, studied their contents. And that's something I, I realized would be a great discovery, but not just as been done in the past in terms of what they might have just contained and move on, but actually to embed it within a larger narrative of this trade network and social uh, economy, structure, etc. And with that, uh, I did some background into the nature of organics trade, because that really is my speciality for, you know, versus metals and other kinds of uh, stone and whatnot. I, I focus more on organics, um, though it, they don't preserve as well. I always felt that it was an understudied area that we can learn a lot. And as my wife points out, in fact, Mediterranean pharmacopoeia is still a major uh, product and market uh, today. Uh, this is actually a product she uses, apparently. I don't know anything about it. But uh, what, what is interesting, I, I did, because of this research, look at some of the, the um, products. And what's fascinating is it's called Moroccan oil, but it's made in Israel, as some of you might know. So once again, tracing back this kind of Mediterranean uh, context to these organics. Uh, but it comes down to the question of what direct evidence do we actually have from antiquity? That is uh, ultimately what we're trying to get at. So in 2003, I started the ArcChem project. It's, been, it's different from what's been done for approximately uh, 20 years. Believe it or not, organic residue analysis, as we call it now, has uh, it really started around 1990 uh, using the latest instruments like GCMS. If, if you really want to press your definition of organic residue analysis, you can, you can go back many generations. A uh, perfect example is uh, in the Egyptian section of the University Museum, uh, there is a bowl from the Middle Kingdom with these dried up um, dates apparently in it. And if you look at the note in a handwritten style, it says, apparently dates as verified by a research assistant or you know, student researcher. And there's like a big chunk missing. And I wonder how they actually uh, verified its, its dates. I, I'm assuming by consumption, which I hope not. I have some of my graduate students here, and they're all shaking their head. Um, but you can argue that's organic residue analysis, uh, much more primitive. Um, and I'm happy to say what we do with the ARCTIM project is, is more sophisticated. So in addition to extracting residues in the field, what I proposed to do originally to set it apart from past studies is also construct uh, a library of these residues. So rather than just analyzing a couple samples and saying yay, nay, it had wine, um, I felt that to get the true value out of this research, we had to ask archaeologically relevant questions. And that leads us back to the site of Cabri. And our focus for tonight uh, in this story is this uh, western area that we now know as a wine cellar. And for those who don't know the site, uh, to orient you, this is kind of the, the small, what we think might have been a smaller courtyard. For those of you who know, the site of Mari, uh, which had some decoration as well, there might have been a larger courtyard down here, like, oops, like at Mari. 
um, the throne room. Uh, two buildings, in the, I mean, the other building, in addition to the wine cellar, I'll point out is the so-called orthostat building, which we think plays into this, this story. Uh, what we're doing next year, uh, in 2015, is excavating what we think is the rest of, well, at least an additional portion of the storage area of the Middle Bronze Palace that you see here in front of you. You can see, uh, I mean, the original goal was to figure out the western extent of the palace proper, and we thought it would be approximately right here, um, but in fact, it just keeps on going, so we have um, a lot of work ahead of us. And here is uh, the wine cellar with Bessie, and as you can see, um, it is remarkably preserved. In fact, it is certainly the best preserved room in the entire site that's yet been discovered. And we were once again fortunate that um, holding our breath, we were able to exhale when in fact Bessie wasn't uh, an anomaly, but in fact there were 39 or so extra vessels. And this is kind of looking to the southeast. Some of you have seen it in the publication. And uh, there is this chamber here, which we're trying to figure out, is, what, does it extend further to the east or not? Um, we'll figure that out next summer and also excavate another room to the south. Um, but what are some of the characteristics of this field research? Um, as I pointed out, this is not just done in museums after the fact. Many of the past studies uh, analyzed residues from vessels that were excavated generations ago mended, glued, washed. Um, you get results like nicotine, uh, glues, sunscreen. Um, I knew that if we could integrate this process early on, um, I felt that we would get the best results. The more pristine the sample, the better result you're likely to get. That's um, not surprising. Also, I wanted to be uh, comprehensive. I wanted to kind of control what we were trying to study rather than just waiting in a lab for an archaeologist to send random samples they think is interesting to you, I actually want to hold more of the initiative, go into the field, and comprehensively uh, sample different assemblages. And finally, for reasons of um, preservation and permitting, I felt that a non-destructive process would be the best. So what are we looking for? We're ultimately looking for this. Um, I got this, my, my students, uh, they kind of cringe when I usually tell the story, but this is um, from a blog, something like I hate my roommates. Um, in fact, I love these roommates or whoever these occupants are because if the room was cleaned out or the, they were fastidious, we would get poor results. But we're looking for vessels that are typically used for a singular kind of purpose, wine storage, perfume manufacture. Because in fact, if you have a kitchen, you, you get a mixture of results. Because what the residue analysis will tell you is what these vessels contain in the past, but they won't tell you in what order and at what time of the vessel's lifetime that it actually contained those organics. So it can complicate things. I typically, at this point, refuse to analyze like basins and you know, uh, thing, frying pans because you'll get a mixture of results. And ultimately, what can that tell you other than they ate food? Um, so we extract as pristine samples as possible in uh, these contexts and ultimately go through this process of, of storing them in vials for future analysis. At Cobry, the, it was complicated by the fact that we had, even though we discovered Bessie the first week, we only had five weeks or so left. We did the math in our head and we realized we weren't going to finish. After a week or so, we were going too slow. So what we did was we pulled everybody from every other area brought them in and we did double shifts. So the original group dug in the morning as usual. The other new participants would stay at the field school, process uh, finds, and come return uh, in the mid-afternoon and continue uh, excavations until dinner time. And because of this technique, we were able to excavate properly all the vessels the day before the season ended. And you can see here in the bottom, I'm taking the sherds for sampling. Um, being able to control, once again, which shirt I wanted to, to take and what seemed most promising. So to be able to uh, add an element of control and consistency to the whole process. Once uh, I return to the field, I extract uh, the residues myself with the help of my students as soon as possible. The, this whole process at Cabri took approximately two to three weeks from taking these vessels out of the ground uh, to going to the Brandeis Department of Chemistry and putting them through the GCMS. So as far as I know, it, uh, there's, it's very rare that samples get processed that quickly. 
they then get filtered into 20 milliliter vials, and here we have this library, 10,000 or so residues uh, by my last count. The next step after extraction is to put them through instrumentation, and it's not by grad student consumption in this day and age. Um, after you put them into smaller vials, you put them through a GCMS. Here's my dissertation instrument, our instrument in Crete, and finally a two or three year old instrument that I currently use at, at Brandeis. Uh, thanks to the department there. What we found with uh, the jars at Cabri were these nicely preserved samples, um, nicely defined peaks. We had a suspicion that based upon how Middle Bronze Age palaces function, the nature of the room and the vessels, that these certainly have to contain liquids. So the two candidates, more often than not, when you have this quantity of liquids, is going to be olive oil or wine. So you can uh, and now, looking at these chromatograms right away, I can usually tell immediately, if you have olive oil, you get all these fatty acids in the middle, and when you get something more dispersed like this, it's typically um, wine. Of course, I can't just look at it and say it's wine. We can't get published that way. We need to have some standards, so we get things like syringic acid, uh, put them through the same exact process, prepare it the same way, and then you compare them. The peaks should match up in time, but then you also look at the mass spectrum and look at the fragments, and then voila, you have syringic acid. It gets a little bit more complicated than that, as you'll see, because yes, syringic acid can occur in trace amounts, perhaps in soil and other plants, but when you put everything together, um, the, the nature of the jars, the nature of a palace like this, uh, certainly it's hard to deny that when you have syringic acid, which is derived from malvadine, that it's a marker for red wine. To make sure that 100 years from now, people don't say, well, these bozos found the only wine cellar intact and they didn't do their best. We invested in addition to new techniques like uh, high quality LIDAR, not like the things from planes that you saw many years ago, but uh, we have people at the cutting edge being able to do two or one millimeter accurate uh, LIDAR uh, analyses and after that we have a nice uh, mapped room for posterity uh, this isn't a, a, a bad image, but in fact, if you zoom in, you'll see that each of these are discrete points accurate to two millimeters. It's, it's kind of difficult to tell, but you can see every crack, every wave in, in all the articulated jars. And that's how I'm a, we're able to publish, in fact, where each shirt came from. What do the results tell us? Well, going way back to the beginning of our, my research, I knew that past studies took very few samples and there were very... There were variables, not only were there many variables, but sometimes the variables weren't even known. Where did the body shirt come from? Where does the shirt even come from? Um, it came maybe from a tertiary context in Amarna. Well, we, we always know that when we have those type of uncertainties that it's an unhealthy platform for research. So that's what this, uh, in addition to finding out what the wine cellar contained, this, this room contained, uh, I want to go beyond that and use it as a case study in how uh, organic residue analysis might tell us more. Ultimately, what we found out is that, in fact, 32 of the, of the 32 jars tested uh, contain tartaric acid, which is a marker for wine, red or white, and then also 29 of the 32 had syringic acid. So at least 29 had red wine, possibly the other three had white wine. We're still trying to investigate whether, in fact, um, it is white wine. We, people say, are you just trying to make spectacular headlines? Not really. If we really want to make spectacular headlines, we would have probably jumped out and said, we have the oldest example of white wine ever found. And we're not going to do that until we're more certain. So we were able to conclude that this was, in fact, a wine cellar. And there was a good deal of consistency between the many jars, even within the same jars. Because in at least one example, uh, on a whim, I took two samples. I ended up taking a sample from down here, which is similar to every other vessel. And I took that shirt right there, which is around halfway up um, the body. And the results, here we are. Um, this is from higher up in the body, uh, 4322. It's from near the base. As far as I know, nobody's ever done a study like this. And what, we, what I found out is, yes, the, the top shirt has syringic and tartaric acid. But in fact, they're in lesser quantity and we're missing a lot of diagnostic compounds. So when we have past studies done, when they claim they have found these compounds, it's usually with, with a total lack of context in terms of the vessel itself. So uh, we took, I took ratios, and when you look at 
the way that these different diagnostic compounds uh, compare to tartaric and syringic acid, you will in fact see that there's a great deal of consistency, uh, more than perhaps we ever imagined. And the final step of the process is trying to interpret what these compounds came from, because though we can find things like sedrol and muronic acid, uh, it doesn't tell us what the ancient commodity was that it came from. But with good, uh, with, with, with research, you can reasonably propose what they came from, not just from the chemistry and phytochemistry, um, but also from other methods I'll show you in a second. So this is a nice chart of the chemical currents of potential additives. The reason why I show it to you is, in fact, uh, you see that many vessels don't contain some of the diagnostics. And what I propose is that there's a reason for that. The other clues we have to support our research is documentation, such as, uh, for instance, uh, the Ebers papyrus. And later on, Plutarch talks about this whole process of, of preparing kaifi first mentioned in the, the pyramid text without really too much context, but definitely by around the 15th century BC, we have a good idea of, of, of how it's used. And you'll notice that Plutarch mentions that it's a potion as well, so it has uh, reason to be consumed. And of course, Mari, just to the north of, of Cabri, we have references to different types of wine and, and additives quite reminis reminiscent of our own wine cellar. So our conclusion is that it is uh, a wine cellar that contained resonated herbal wines, and they were fairly consistent and of good quality. As we know, um, wine, especially back then, was not just consumed by anyone. Unlike beer, there are, there are significant constraints of when you can actually produce wine and storage and other types of things, I'm sure. Um, we'll hear hopefully more about in the coming minutes. What else can we conclude? I pointed out those different uh, instances of these additives. What I think now is, based upon the consistency, I don't think it's random due to preservation, but there's a rationale behind it. Could we, is there any pattern between what was, were contained in these jars and their location? And I think there is a significant pattern. For one, the, the jars that contained just wine uh, without, with a dearth of additives, they pretty much occur right here. There, is, there are two entrances and a platform right here, and this is an entrance space in the palace. So what I propose is that the wine was brought in this way and that they were lined up over here. These jars contained uh, not just the wine, but additives in various states of, of, of quantity. And underneath 26, there is that installation you saw from the area photo. What almost certainly is going on here is in addition to small vessels and dippers and, and bowls. This must have been where, after they brought in the wine, they perhaps added these different types of herbs. In an interesting twist, these are the jars that didn't have syringic acid. Perhaps it could be due to preservation, but as these jars get conserved, we're hoping that there's some kind of marker on them that might distinguish them from the others. Then our argument for it being white wine will become much stronger. Over here in this little antechamber and these jars as well, you can see they covered the entrance so they didn't go back in after what we think is an earthquake. These are the jar jars that had pretty much every ingredient. So you can see the pattern here. The jars are brought in, um, they're triaged there, and then at certain times they're processed with this platform and these dippers. Um, perhaps they're cooled down, some, maybe water added to them, we don't know. And then they're brought in this way and stored. And as you'll see in a second, there is then a path that goes straight to what we think is a banqueting area. The orthostat building I pointed out at the beginning, this was taken in 2011 before the wine cellar was discovered. This is looking to the south, so the wine cellar is to your right. And if you go out that one entrance, you end up right around here. And this is the orthostat building, and this seemed to be a storage room connected to this. There was one jar I did test in 2011, and it did contain tartaric acid. So we think this was the immediate storage area for some kind of feasting that occurred in the orthostat building. Uh, and based upon the Fano analysis, you can see this is the orthostat building. This was one area we dug further down, and that's where we found a concentration of uh, all kinds of, of animals. Um, if, you, if you could look at these two areas, in addition to sheep and goats, there are, there's an entire bull. So there's some kind of feasting activity uh, being done here, probably connected to the wine. So then you can see this, this is all late Bronze Age uh, 
representations of, of wine drinking. But you can see perhaps what was going on in this orthostat building. Uh, what are the next steps here as, as I wrap up? Well, there's an intriguing twist to um, what is being found. Uh, what we didn't realize is that in Israel, um, the vineyards kind of went out of use after the Islamic incursion. And for around a millennium, there really were no um, working active vineyards of, consider of any size. And it was in the 19th century that Baron de Rothschild, using grape varieties imported from his chateaus in Bordeaux, sometimes we think via India of all places, that viticulture was reestablished in the Galilee. Uh, we also have a Ptolemy papyrus that describes an estate just around 10 miles or so to the southeast of Cabri, uh, which we, we think is modern Bina. And this papyrus mentions that 80,000 vines produced wine of, of good quality. The, uh, Glaucius, the, the writer, states that he can't distinguish these wines from heels. We're not sure if he's just being nice, but what we're proposing is, in fact, um, it's not just low-quality wine, but there's a certain high quality to the, the wine being produced just in the backyard of Cadre. Salvage excavation, excavations in the Tel uh, right next to uh, Beinab revealed, in fact, that there was a major site for viticulture, that all kinds of implements connected to, to, to uh, viticulture, we think, and the finds just continue all the way on back to EB1B. So we think that this has, was traditionally a, a wine production area, and we're now trying to connect it to, to Cadbury. So if grape DNA can be isolated next, uh, next summer, it's actually going on right now. With all these, we saved all the soil from inside the jars, they're being sieved. We're looking for grape pips, anything that will produce DNA. Then we can compare it to feral grapes, perhaps, that are located near Carmiel uh, and also in European vineyards. And we hope then to find varieties that are more closely related to what was being used to produce the Cabri wine. Uh, one of the first things that usually people ask me, I just gave a talk at a synagogue um, last spring, and the first thing they ask is, can, can you help them produce better wine? I'm not, I'm not sure if that will actually happen or not, but if we can perhaps find a, a variety that's, that over centuries acclimated to the Levant rather than the Atlantic coast of, of France, um, we suspect there might be better material grapes um, that could produce wine that, that is particular to the southern Levant. And just quickly, you can see Cabri's at the head of the spring, and there is the state that's mentioned in the, the Xenon papyrus. So next summer, we'll, we'll go through the countryside and hopefully find some feral grapes. But I want to, before uh, Dr. Green is, 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 comes up, I wanted to connect it to what we're doing now. So you can see this, this map of the Phoenician activities, and here we are at Cabri. Um, in addition to being uh, in the Galilee next summer, uh, I'll take students to East Crete, and we'll also look for uh, varieties there that perhaps there we hope that the Phoenicians brought um, 3,000 plus years ago. Uh, we know people, uh, Herodotus mentions uh, a Phoenician trader there, and a purple dye dealer, and we think that's connected. And we're collaborating with uh, the Mandavi Wine Institute at UC Davis and also Woods Hole to try to proceed um, with the next steps. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for that introduction, and Jane for your overall introduction and plugging the uh, Sardinia trip. Um, and thank you all for coming this evening. I hope uh, you will come away with a greater appreciation of ancient wine and, and uh, a contemporary appreciation of modern wine. Now, Andrew has covered um, the second millennium very thoroughly, so let me turn now backward in time. Uh, first to prehistory of the 6th and 5th millennium BC, and then to the Iron Age of the 1st millennium BC, and beyond that to the late antiquity of Byzantium. So hold on tight, we're going to take this at a gallop. Um, let's see now, this is Andrew's control, let me see if I can figure out how to do this. Ah, there we go. Uh, just a, a bit of a reminder of our locale. The Mediterranean region on the north is Europe, and the south is North Africa. Beyond that is the Middle East. Note the locations of the coasts and islands, 
the mountains and the rivers because they're very important in understanding the distribution of wild grape, Vitis vinifera sylvestris, grape, wine grapes of the woodlands. Um, and you'll see here, let's see, this is the, oh, wait a minute. There we go. This is the point. There we go. Um, you'll see that it hugs the coastlines and goes up into the river valleys, covers all of Italy, all of Greece, a bit around the, De the Black Sea, and down into the Levant. It doesn't like high mountains, so it is not, not, not up in the Alps. It doesn't like dry places, so it's not down in the Sahara. And it doesn't like heat, so there's this dashed line here below which it does not occur from about the tip of Cap Bon here in North Africa all the way across to the Carmel Ring uh, point. Um, note there's no distribution in the Nile Valley in the Dead Sea Rift there or in Mesopotamia. Um, these are places where people brewed and drank beer, not because they were low class, but because they had lots of grain, which they could turn into a shelf-stable storage stored item, which actually had some uh, caloric content. Uh, in a place where bread is made daily and won't keep because it has no preservatives, beer does. Now, where did wine come from within this range of wild grape? The presumption, of course, is that People found wild grapes. They somehow domesticated them and turned them into domesticated grapes, as they did with other wild, uh, wild progenitors of cultivars, wheat, barley, sheep, and goat. Well, there is the Noah hypothesis. And Noah, you know, famously was the builder of the ark, which saved a certain part of mankind from the great flood. And he made landfall on top of Mount Ararat, which is right there, southern Caucasus. Um, now, there was a famous um, sequel to the Noah story in which Noah is, there you see Ararat, a, germ, a, a, a uh, Russian or, Orientalist painter, and here you see the curse of Ham and Canaan. This is the sequel in which Noah is credited with being either the first, first vintner or at least the first person to plant a vineyard, although the translation of the verb is somewhat unsure. Uh, he gets drunk, he's lying in his tent with no clothes on, and his sons, Shem, Jephthah, and Ham, understand what's happened. Shem and Jephthah are properly uh, circumspect, and they cover up his nakedness, but not before Ham has caught sight of him. And in reaction to this, Noah curses not Ham, but his son Canaan. And this whole description here um, sounds a lot like a justification for this, the, a later status quo in which Canaan and Israel are at loggerheads because of, in the Iron Age. But that's a biblical interpretation I won't detain us with now. There is, um, of course, um, biblical stories make great fodder for painters. And here you see Bellini's um, interpretation, giving, um, ha uh, giving Ham the sort of... <laughs> giving Ham the sort of uh, leer and uh, with uh, Shem and Jephthah with their eyes firmly closed. Now, this is prehistory. If we, if we fast forward into the third millennium, after the, eventual, the ultimate domestication of grape and its production as wine, we come to uh, another one of these trade networks of which Andrew has spoken. This one of the third millennium, and it's the, the two nodes on this trade network are Byblos in what is now modern Lebanon, in the coast of Phoenicia, and just for simplicity's sake, Abydos, um, one of the necropoli of the Egyptian uh, old kingdom. There were other stops along the way, but these two are places where early, early discoveries were made about the connections between these two regions. Um, this millennium, this third millennium, late fourth into the third millennium between 3500 BC and about 2000 BC, was in, 
can be called the dawn of civilization. Lots of writing, urbanization, impressive public works like temples and fortifications, massive royal tombs, appropriately appointed with royal goods for the royal afterlife. And in the old kingdom of Egypt, one of those goods was wine. Now, here at Abydos, at this uh, cemetery at Um al Khab, the mother of potsherds, um, was found a certain kind of vessel. Do you see? Well, here's Byblos, the Phoenician node. And at, at Abydos, it was found a certain kind of ware like this. This jar is about 17 centimeters high, it's not quite uh, six inches. And this is the route by which some of that material came early on in the early Bronze Age, from around 3500 to 3000 BC. It came over land, and evidence of a donkey caravan trade has been found archaeologically along the north coast of Sinai. Later on, trade picked up considerably. It was carried by sea from Byblos down to the Nile Delta, ultimately to Abydos. One of the early excavators at Abydos discovered these jars and uh, in large quantities in the royal tombs. He understood immediately that these were not native Egyptian production, although he named them for a site in Egypt. He understood them to be something else, and these, this something else was Canaanite. Now, the origins of this material, this uh, this very particular kind of jar, um, seems to have been as containers for liquids. Now, none that I know of have been tested for contents of wine or oil. We'll assume for the purposes of this lecture that it was wine. Um, and it seems that the old king of Egyptians were stocking this stuff away for the afterlife like crazy. Um, the treatment of the vessel, this earthenware vessel, was such using a slip, very liquid clay, and then a burnish, which was using a, a, a blunt tool to seal the pores of the uh, earthenware so that it held liquids better. The effect of this roaring trade between the Canaanites on the coast, the Egyptians in the delta, in, in the Nile Valley, uh, had an economic stimulating effect in Canaan itself. And we see in this early Bronze II and III period, after 3000 BC up to 2000, um, a huge upsurge in urbanism, in the size of sites, in the extent of population. It seems they were responding to the Egyptian demand by producing wine not for local consumption, but for at export quantities. And uh, they're producing the same kinds of large uh, volumes of trade that had, as I say, this economic boost. Um, now, this all came to a crashing end around 2000 BC. We're not sure, sure why. Egypt collapsed. Early Bronze Age and Canaan collapsed. And it wasn't until uh, later in the Bronze Age that it reemerged. That's Andrew's millennium. I'll leave that alone. We're going we're gonna to fast forward to the Iron Age. Now, the main players in this Iron Age scenario are the Egyptians, or the Phoenicians, and the Greeks. Um, who explored, then later settled uh, the coasts and islands of the Mediterranean, trading as they went. The Phoenicians got out a little ahead of everybody. They began from Tyre, the mother city of Carthage. Um, famously, um, it's an offshore island connected to the mainland only during a siege laid by Alexander the Great. Now it's a sleepy little uh, minor town with occupation on the ancient site. It's a little hard to sort out what was there in the Iron Age. We have some legends that talk about the founding of Carthage by the sister of the king, one Elissa by name, Dido in, in, uh, in Aeneas' telling, um, who was the founder of the city. Carthage, the other end of the middle of the Mediterranean, known as an archaeological foundation from around the 9th century. Here you see what is the Citadel Hill, the Birsa, right there, or what's re, what are the remains of the ancient city? This is, of course, modern Tunis, and that is a French ex-cathedral of the 19th century sitting right on top of the citadel. We know something about the connection between 
Tyre and Carthage uh, from the text, but we don't have much in the way of physical evidence except for deep sea shipwrecks located right there, north of the Sinai. Um, these deep sea shipwrecks clearly are carrying pottery, again, special custom made for carrying of wine from Tyre, somewhere to the west, maybe only as far as Egypt, but conceivably to Carthage because these jars have been found in both places. The shipwreck looks like this on the bottom of the ocean. It's 400 meters down, so it was excavated um, by remote control with assistance from Robert Ballard. Here you see, all right, here you see um, some of those jars that were recovered by remote control vehicles. Um, staged as they might have appeared in the hull of this ship, stacked up for shipment. Um, of course, the wine that was in them, I presume it was wine again, uh, was long gone. But petrographically, by analysis of the clay which make these jars, they seem to have been made somewhere on the south coast of Phoenicia. Now you see up here, Marseille and a site called Vix, which is really pretty far up into central France. Um, here the Greeks are implicated. Um, they settled Marseille about 600 BC, a good, good deal after Carthage, and dealt with the Gauls, who were the indigenous populations, sorry, the indigenous populations of central France. In and from Marseille here, it's again another modern town sitting on top of an ancient one. That crater, it's a mixing bowl for wine, was found in a Gaulish tomb near Vix, way up in central France. It's a meter 63 high. It was made in parts and assembled in Vix and put in a tomb of an elite Gaulish princess, we presume, who died at the age of about 30, a woman of full years. Uh, along with a wine drinking set. It seems to say a lot about how thirsty the Gauls were for Greek wine. Now, they had already had their own uh, concoction of mead um, that gave them a nice buzz, but they developed the cultural habit of drinking wine because it was something appropriate for those that could afford it to do. Some things never change. Now, Moving on into much later periods, uh, wine takes on not simply a cultural role, but also an important um, ideological and theological role in the celebration of the Christian communion. And certain sites in, around the Mediterranean um, are, again, archaeological loci, which evidence for that occurs. Now, communion was in the Christian tradition the observance of a commemoration of the Last Supper uh, observed by uh, Jesus and his disciples as part of their Jewish Passover. Um, the elaborateness with which that ritual was developed within the Byzantine church is remarkable. Here you see mosaic from Ravenna, a very famous depiction of uh, Justinian and Theodora. Uh, she is holding a jeweled chalice for the celebration of the communion as part of the Byzantine rite. Um, whether that wine came from a local source or perhaps the Holy Land, we don't know. But we do know from the distribution of amphora of this sort and this sort, which are actually named in text with these Greek names, Gazition and Mescalonion, um, that they are distributed across the Mediterranean in Byzantine sites as far north as London. And it seems that wine from the Holy Land had a special significance for the celebration of the Eucharist. Um, now, of course, they may have enjoyed the wine that came from the, from the Holy Land for its own sake. Uh, and this is something of a leap of faith, as it were. But it does suggest that the economic power of wine plays not only into into desires of culture, but desires of, for other sorts of expressions. Um, now, from the same text that name these amphora types, uh, we know that wine was used also, not just for um, 
religious celebration, but also in pharmacopoeia, as uh, Andrew has already alluded. Um, there are actual recipes uh, and uh, prescriptions for the mixing of wine with certain kinds of herbs and other additives uh, for the treatment of various sorts of complaints. I suppose the fact that there was a high alcohol content probably didn't hurt either. Now, finally, turn to the island of Jerba, um, legendarily the location of the land of lotus eaters, um, the place where uh, the sailors from the Odyssey whiled away several years forgetting about their homecoming. Um, in 19th century Tunisia, there's also a large settlement of Jews, part of the diaspora that was expelled from Spain, the uh, Reconquista. Um, they, despite the fact that Tunisia was nominally a Muslim country, they still maintain their traditions of growing and grapes and making wine. And they used recipes that echo the recipes we know from antiquity. And with, you know, I'll simply close with a little evocative picture of the beach at Jerba as you think about how a little bit of wine might make um, an appropriate uh, conclusion to our evening. Now, we are going to have a bit of a, a panel discussion, but if you keep it short, we can get to the wine. <laughs> Exit? Yeah. I'll let you know. Thanks very much to both of you for that fascinating tour of the ancient Near East. So we have time for a few questions, and I'd be delighted to open it up and uh, try to moderate the panel as we go. Who would like to ask these experts some questions? Please make sure your mic is on. Hmm? Thank you. My mic's on. Okay. I will yell really loud. It's <laughs> a handheld for you. We're joined by Carrie Platt of the uh, Wine Bottega. She's going to give us a few words later on about the, um, the wines that you're going to be tasting very shortly, just in the next building. So questions for Andrew or Jesse. Please. Uh, so 3,000 years ago, when you think that it everybody got some wine, or just the wealthy and powerful? Um, well, my family history is that uh, everybody made a little bit of home. What changed in the third millennium was that it was, the production was stepped up to supply a demand that was greater than household demand. And um, that led to, probably in that era, uh, massive creation of terraces for growing wine, uh, creation of treading basins for treading grapes to produce the grape juice, and other ancillary facilities. I mean, it's, 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 it is. The, the, the tying together a lot of different bits of evidence. But, I mean, you know, even, even during the American prohibition, householders were committed to make a certain quantity of wine for their own consumption. So it wasn't a matter of saying to people you can't drink at all, but good stuff comes to happen. If you look at over uh, 5,000 years ago, one thing I just think is clear, and we see the oldest wine cellar, the initial wine cellar, the is there are older production centers that have been found. Um, at least it seems uh, the, the famous one in Armenia. And they, for a long time, claimed that it's the oldest. And then they trumped one in northern Greece. And recently, there's another one that was found in northern Greece, which they're saying is now the oldest. It goes kind of back and forth between Armenia and northern Greece. Uh, and what you notice there is it's quite some time ago, before you see major signs of social stratification, it seems to be a communal affair. I have a question about your two maps, the striking one with the vine mm -hmm. that grows all over the Mediterranean, yeah. and the ending one where the vine is still being exported from Phoenicia to all those regions. Right. How come? Well, well uh, I, 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 what I think has happened in North Africa in the Iron Age is that after a couple of millennia of domesticated grape and wine production, that part of the Mediterranean. The Phoenicians actually made landfall in North Africa. They 
discover an indigenous population which is Neolithic. They are farmers and herds in the villages. Uh, they domesticated uh, some plants, but they haven't gone through what we often refer to as a horticultural revolution. And they bring with them uh, domestic stalks of domesticated cuttings from domesticated vines, and they graft them onto existing vines and develop a wine industry. And also the habit of drinking wine. It, it, it is a classic colonial situation in which the people from abroad arrive with everything that they need to live with as they were accustomed to living. It includes the mental templates for what they expect to eat and drink, how they build the houses, and the gods they worship. And uh, there's much later uh, the evidence for this culturation of these local populations, which refers to broadly as Berbers, to Phoenicia, to Phoenician language and, and Phoenician culture, but they maintain their own uh, um, traditions as well. We don't really know much about their in that context. Yes, please, in the back. Uh, firstly, uh, have you been able instrumentally to distinguish between practice of dissolving veritas in the water to preserve it and applying to the domestic interior of the vessel as a mechanical uh, way of keeping the fluid in and the air out. So that's actually the process right now. So the best the, the wine jars at least at Calvary are at the University of Iowa. Uh, the main obstacle we're facing right now, as some of you who are involved in conservation know, is the estimate out we were throwing out is by the time it's said and done uh, to conserve Study product for each of these jars would be tens of thousands of dollars each. So at this point, we're trying to decide. Almost certainly, we're not going to um, conserve every single jar. I mean, if, if that happens, there's actually some thought that, uh, what last I checked, that the jars would be dispersed throughout the country <laughs> and conserved by local area museums. We're not sure if that's going to happen. But obviously, there's, there's difficulties with that. I mean, who's going to buy them? What kind of consistency are you going to have? Um, they, we, what we decided is we, we are going to focus on three to five jars, and that's what's being studied right now for the grape remains. And I, I, they asked me, what do you suggest? And uh, the first thing I said is, can we do the two or three from my, well, my white ones, because you want to see if there's any marking on those vessels, if anything about them that could, can differentiate from the rest of the jars. And then we're going to probably do a couple from the antechamber to have that there. Um, what, you raise a question you raised, which is quite excellent, is I also think we should do one from near the entrance, which had very little additive, supposedly. At that point, um, we think that they came in already with storax residue in it. Is it from the coating of the inside of the jar? Quite possibly, um, because every jar pretty much had storax. Is it for preserving the wine? Is it for something to do with the actual vessel? Or possibly both, that's another, you know, um, issue um, that, that, that's quite possible. It would be fascinating with this. Second question again for Botany. Um, in Gerba, as famous in the Lotus land, has anybody analyzed the, the, uh, the wine residues for the, 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 the diagnostic uh, outboard of the Lotus? But last but not least, if you're looking for feral grapes that are traded for wine that was manufactured without interruptions, Good place to start are the Kalash the Amer Hunza Valley in Pakistan, where it's still going, the new lenders are still going strong despite uh, the rejection of their the crop group. You mentioned entry of the, the reintroduction of the commercial wine production in Israel in the 19th century. Same thing happened in Tunisia. Yeah. Uh, when, the, when the French took over in 1881, uh, they measured. And they found about a thousand hectares under great cultivation that was called table varieties. And it was actually French religious orders that brought back into Tunisia the production of wine. And um, it was it was tolerated because the French were in charge. And it's even after the French left, it was tolerated because the tourists found it. So, um, these days, one doesn't know. In the back, yeah. The arrangement of the jars in the bottom of the site uh, seems to indicate that there was some work going on at the time. We have kind of a moment when they 
coming along in the next day shows the time. What event occurred to prevent the destruction or the disturbance of these? Well, that, that's a great point because just next door to the old Parker Sat building, what we thought was a ramp of some sort, because it was perpendicular to the long axis of the room, it actually continues into the wine cellar and it's at a it's at an angle. And we're going to bring in a geophysicist next summer because what almost certainly happened is that this is an earthquake. And because of the lighter data, what we're also doing is we're bringing out the vectors of all the jars. And we have the base, so that we have where the, the, the property center of the ribbons are. And we're hoping to reconstruct um, what state the room was in. Apparently, it was being used. Um, I, I looked at a perfume workshop in Crete for my dissertation, and that it seemed to have been out of use for who knows how long when an earthquake hit. For this, it was literally it was, it was in the state of being used, and then the earthquake hit. The, the, the interesting question is, uh, we can understand why you don't go back in, because the structure is compromised, it's dangerous, and certainly the wine is all gone. The, the jars are cracked, it's spilled out, but why did they not uh, go back and do that? I mean, it's good for us that they didn't then build on top of it. And in general, there's no way for that activity right there at the palace, that's great. But we don't think that it was the view destruction horizon that ends the occupation of that immediate area. So why did they do something with it? Did they just give up on saying we have a wine cellar? Or we're not quite sure what happened. We're trying to find out. So what is it to make white on white? Red on red? So all the color in a grape is in uh, in the skins, except for one grape, all the which I weird trivia thing that ever comes up that actually has a red center as well. Uh, so that's just the difference is the, uh, the skin contact with red wine, which actually will lead into some of the trickier white wines we're going to taste tonight. I was going to say on the question about the resin as well, sort of looking into more modern uh, wine making with, in Greece, you know, resonated wine started in Greece 2,500 years ago. And, you know, at first the resin was for protecting the wine from oxidation, but then people be came to like that style. So then it developed into actually putting it into the wine. So there's sort of a chicken and egg that I wonder how that, that comes through, you know, for better or worse. So it started out that way and then purposely they were putting it in the wine. Yes, please. You're looking at your varieties of grape, but you're also looking at the recipes as they evolve. Uh, well, that's the thing that we're trying to figure out right now is using this, these different forms of documentation, are we able to reconstruct it. Um, there have been, at this point, I think we've been approached by the developing uh, wineries to recreate the wine. Um, we know that there's commercial concerns that have to sell. Um, at the same time, we suspect that totally trying to recreate it won't suit modern palates. So I don't think, it's like beer. I don't think anybody wants to drink Egyptian beer, right? No, I mean, so some of those sort of ancient styles of beers are selling. There's like five hundred dollar bottles of beers now that are okay. sort of recreating that experience. So well, we create so like the Midas touch, but yeah. it's truly totally <laughs> like the like the orgy, yeah. you know, uh, it's more of a meal. I think. Andrew, could you talk a little bit about the process of getting those residues to Brandeis? You mentioned that you analyze them so quickly, and did you have to get immediate special permissions, and was it difficult or easy? That's actually one of the major reasons why I did this in. Israel versus uh, Greece. I did my dissertation in Greece. We expedited the export process there, worked with the U.S. Embassy, uh, and the speedy uh, permitting process was around nine months. And after we did that, we tried to send, send it through a uh, diplomatic cover, but after 9-11 it wasn't possible. So I had to, we shipped it with like DHL and I, was, I remember this period, this I'll never forget, it was 2003, I believe. I'm there tracking the DHL, like, you know, I, I spent untold amounts of hours producing all this, um, securing these samples, and I hope I never see anything like this again in tracking, but it said, scheduled for destruction. Hmm. <laughs> so I just saw my PhD you know, disappear in front of my eyes. That's a little um, different from scheduled for pickup, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> But we had a letter from the, from the U.S. Embassy, from all the different, and then finally we, we all ran, so there's someone from Greece calling, I'm calling from Philadelphia, everybody's calling uh, DHL, and then they said, oh yeah, yeah, we found your notes, we're not going to 
incinerate it. <laughs> so after that, I said, maybe I should think about returning to Greece later. Um, and in Israel, as you can imagine, it's, 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 it's so much simpler to get that to the process and everything else. Um, in terms of the wine cellar itself, uh, it was absolutely no problems. I mean, it, at this point, when I get when I leave uh, the Ben Gurion Airport, they, they, they know that I'm an archaeologist. And they, you know, I've, I've brought like hot plates out and they don't blank it. So, nice. We have time for a couple more questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, that there were different types of wines, like one of the quotes from the Bible, and you mentioned When we say strong wine, does that mean it was not locked down? What makes it strong? What's, were there additives in it? And that's the things that we're still, I don't think anyone knows. Yeah, when I tried to do a little bit more research onto, I will admit, ancient wines are not my area of expertise, uh, and more in the natural wine camp. But yeah, the, the wines that we're going to taste, I was trying as much as possible to give you a chance to taste a bit of history. And the way that I can kind of recreate that with modern wines is a little bit through. Uh, different forms of preservation. So, you know, I don't have any sort of wine potions to share with you. As I was listening to this, I was thinking something like Namara or that sort of style with the herbal infusions actually would have been appropriate. I hadn't thought of that before though. But, uh, yeah. I'll just say this. Um, the bottling of wine and putting in, and corking it up in a dirty glass bottle, fairly recent development. And in antiquity, there was never really no way to get that kind of seal, even with a slip in an earnest jar like so most ancient wines, after they'd sat for a while, were pretty stiff stuff. And that's why, almost, almost uh, without fail, the wines were served mixed with water. And, and one, of the, one of the biblical occasions against the drunkard is he drinks unmixed wine. Takes it straight. And a last question. Yeah, in the back. In addition to the uh, great DNA that you were looking for, uh, you thought about what you I think a lot of that has to do with the state of preservation. Um, I mean, I probably shouldn't say this, but uh, the latest word I heard just days ago is that from 60,000 grape tips in the jars, uh, we'll see what, what we can get out of them. In terms of things like uh, like yeast and other ingredients, that would be obviously much tougher, I think. Um, but it's something to aspire for. Um, even though these jars are over 3,000 years old, you never know. I mean, we're just We'll be ecstatic to see if we can extract good DNA out of these grape tips because um, almost certainly, uh, I know in the modern day there's these great data banks and that's what we're going to use to compare it. But as far as we know, there's been some studies done, especially with like Roman uh, wines, um, but we don't think there's any uh, Bronze Age uh, DNA sequences from what we can tell. We asked around, like, is it not wine? Because they don't think so as well. Um, I guess it's an academic enterprise, we're happy to share it if it does result in, in good DNA, and then we'll have to see where it takes us after that. So that would be a fascinating thing if we can have you back next year for an update on the, on the coming season. So Carrie, would you like to give a few words and instructions for us on what we're about to experience, and then we will all walk that way, one building, to the Semitic Museum and upstairs for our wine tasting. Fill us in. So can you hear me if I don't use the microphone? The microphone's make me very nervous. The light is right in my eyes, so I'm not behind you guys. I'm also a hand talker. Um, so I was really excited when I got this opportunity to come and uh, be a part of this lecture. I wanted to be an archaeologist when I was little, and I don't know how I sort of got off track with that. Got more off track when I got into wine business, I suppose. But, uh, so it was really fun doing some investigation and what, what would make sense to, to tie this together. So I really wanted to try to give you the experience of maybe a little bit of what these wines may have tasted like. Uh, so the first thing I thought of was doing a Retsina. So please don't make a horrible face if you've uh, encountered Retsina, particularly sort of in the period between 1960 and 1980, where there's an absolute rock gut uh, that was produced. You know, the reason it came about, as you're imagining, is that this pine resin was used to seal the amphora to protect the wine from oxidation. So these are things people did, you know, before temperature control and sulfur additions and all those things to protect the wines. And the style caught on, and people decided that they wanted their wines 
Uh, unfortunately, Retsina became so popular, and a lot of times with wine, once something becomes popular, a lot of people jump on the bandwagon and the quality drops sharply. So uh, Retsina kind of went very much out of style. Fortunately, a few producers now are really excited to kind of reintroduce the world to why this wine became popular in the first place. So I have not tasted this one yet. I'm really excited. It's from uh, the Kekers uh, Winery in Thessaloniki. They're one of the oldest uh, family-operated wineries in northern Greece. They started in about 1911. Kind of speaking to the glass bottles, they were actually uh, the uh, founder of the winery was the first one to introduce glass bottles uh, into uh, into Greek winemaking. So glass bottles made in the United States. So pretty amazing to put that in, in perspective. Um, next up, uh, sort of have a double whammy. So wines in this time were uh, produced in Athra. So nowadays there are some producers who are really sort of harkening back to those times and the natural wine movement to try to you know, basically get some modern technology out of the way and just enjoy wines that are, you know, a true expression of the grapes and the land. So we're going to travel to Sicily and uh, the Pass Winery in Vittoria. And it's three friends who kind of started making wine almost as a game as they graduated from college. One of their fathers gave them 2,000 tons of Mirabello and said, have at it, and they stomped on the grapes and became hooked. And they really were drawn into the wine business because they saw that it was a way to look at history and to look at the land you know, their beloved Sicily. So they decided to sort of take everything uh, out of the way and uh, just use the uh, indigenous grape varieties that were from there. And they also found out about Amphora and they said, we have to do this. So you're going to taste uh, two wines that are both aged in Amphora, one for just seven, uh, one for just two months and one for seven months. And they're also white wines that are made of what's called the orange <laughs> wine style. So we're talking a little bit about red versus white. So with all the color in the wine being the skins, when you make red wine, you leave the skins in contact with the juice to get all of that color. And when you do it, you get the tannin, uh, which is the structure and the backbone of the wine too, and imparts some flavors. But when you make white wine, typically you take the skins out of the juice right away because you're not really looking for anything. But historically, those skins were left in contact with white wine to help in the preservation. Tannin acts, acts as a preservative. So it's something just even in the last like 10 years that we've started to see producers experiment. So I would say it's you know your way to taste white wine how they were made a thousand years ago. Uh, some people love them, some people hate them, but uh, it's definitely an interesting experience. Uh, and then last up, I was reading a little bit about uh, wine in ancient Greece and that uh, it was uh, considered to be uh, very spiritual because of its resemblance to blood, which brought to mind a wine called Sanguine Judah, or the blood of Judas which is a wine that comes from the Ultimo Cabeze in Lombardy. And it got its name from the monks because they banned it, because uh, they thought it incited people to lascivious behaviors. So one of my favorite wines to end the evening on. Uh, <laughs> but it's also similar in style to wines uh, from these times, which were often uh, sweet red wines. So this will be a sweet uh, wine um, that is slightly sparkly um, from sort of the natural fermentation uh, of the wine. So it will be a little triumvirate uh, of fish food for you to taste, and I will stop talking because I am the last one standing between you and the wine. <laughs> so we will now move to the liquid portion of our program. I want to thank our speakers and all of you for coming. For the next door over, come imbibe and enjoy.